Live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome everyone into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running and nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Everyone, hey, welcome into the program. So today on the show, we have the one, the only, Mr. Ralph Bond, longtime Computer America contributor, and he's waiting oh so patiently in the wings, but uh, yeah, he is our science and technology trends correspondent. And as you can you know, maybe guess from his title, we are going to be talking about some things that are cutting edge, a lot of things that are, you know, kind of science medical related it's it's all fun and we're really looking forward to it but before we do that everyone computeramerica.com that's where you'll find everything including past shows future shows if you can't catch us live on irn then the podcast is the second best place to do so uh while you're there also check out uh links to social media best way to keep up to date with what we're doing uh along with the website and uh yeah all that and more so i you know everyone i hope that you're having a wonderful friday and you are ready for um you know you're ready for the program i know that you know there's uh you know and i i haven't really brought this up lately but you know weather's going crazy covid's not going away and um seems like there's a lot of craziness out there so everyone i hope that you're staying safe and somehow staying sane that's the uh that's the important part because you know you can stay safe but if you don't stay sane hey that's uh that's the crazy one so everyone uh why don't we go ahead bring on our guest and we'll go ahead and get started with uh with our show today so everyone as i said before ralph bond you may remember him as the voice of our intel digital minute he is of course uh an author he you know he does uh correspondence for uh k uh wkex if i'm not mistaken if uh, and of course i can have uh yep and uh and of course that's ralph there and ralph welcome on to the program how you doing hey hey it's great to be here and you know what ben i'll tell you what today's mission is science and technology that's going to uplift us in a world of covid d mm-hmm. ugh, COVID fires d, in the it, west it, it, is that what they're calling it now i i'm not well really i don't mentioned. know the delta variant yes, of COVID. gotcha <laughs> covid <duh>. the weather <laughs> anyway, yeah we got the weather we got fires in the west and terrible heat waves most of the country just it, uh, terrible political strife and mm-hmm. uh, afghanistan my heart goes out to anyone who's an afghanistan veteran or anybody who lost somebody in our forces in Afghanistan, because here we go again. I'm old enough to vive. Well, I was in the National Guard when Saigon fell in April mm-hmm. of 75. And uh, we all just thought, what was it for? What was yeah. it all for? And I just, anyway, I don't want to go to the, So there's all the Debbie Downer stuff. Mm-hmm. We're going to go up, up, up. We're going to use science and technology to give us hope for the future how's that <laughs> we can de- we can definitely do our best and of course you know so, and and you know uh you have also worked into our stories from time to time you know kind of military stuff but it's military stuff that uh you know either protects troops or gives them tools to you know uh right. you know kind of do things in a non-lethal right. way so you know and but also these stories in general uh while they're cutting edge they're science they're you know uh nature related things like that yeah. but ralph you yeah. also try to find stuff that's not uh, that maybe not everyone has heard about. 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. So what I do is I look for, and I do this for you, uh, for Computer America and our listeners here, and for KEX Radio, the Mark Mason Show, every Friday here in Portland, Oregon, which is just a blast. But again, I look for stories that are just not on the mainstream radar. And it's understandable because there's so much technology development going on. It can't be covered by the uh, mainstream media. So I look for those special stories and collect them. Some of them are profound. Some of them are kind of out there and wacky and goofy. So it's a fun mix of things. Definitely, definitely, definitely. So yeah, and I think the best uh, way to take from here would to be just, you know, get started with story number one. And yeah. this one, um, you know, it, it's wearables have, I think, become a thing. You know, most people have a smartwatch or something like that. Yes. But, yes. you know, they have so much more potential. So story number one. Yeah, story number one is great. And by the way, folks, don't forget to come out to the computeramerica.com website to get the show notes because the show notes will have all the links images and all the, the commentary and so forth. So if you want to follow up on a story or more important, if we don't get through the 14 stories I have prepared for today, you can go back and reference those and so on. So with that said, story number one, this one, I just love this. Scientists create a new wearable device that turns your sweaty finger into a battery. What? <laughs> it comes from CNET, a story by Mira, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Eisenberg. And uh, there's a little photograph in the show notes that shows this thing. And here we go. So nano engineering scientists at UC San Diego have come up with a device that uses sweat from your fingertip to generate power. And I thought, wait a minute. Fun fact, I did a little side research myself. Our fingertips are packed with more than a thousand sweat glands. What? Mm. And can produce between 100 to 1,000 times more sweat than most other body parts. And I thought, oh, maybe that's why when I touch my smartphone screen or touch a sc uh, my tablet or whatever, and it's the smudgies, I thought, yeah. I'm just a slimy guy. <laughs> no, I'm normal. Everyone is. I have sweat glands and all these fingertips. Anyway, <laughs> so the scientists at UC San Diego created a flexible, thin strip that wraps around the tip of a finger like a Band-Aid and converts chemicals found in human sweat into small amounts of electrical energy. Okay, fingers constantly produce sweat. So the device can work without the user moving a muscle. So no matter what you're doing, you could be asleep at night and you're still producing sweat, as, mm -hmm. as it were, on your fingertips. So reality check. The device they created potentially can power electronics that operate in the milliwatt range, like a, a wristwatch like this one here, but it's not yet suitable for continuously powering electronics such as a smartphone. But this was my add-on to this conversation, mm -hmm. uh, not in the article. I thought to myself, well, maybe these fingertip strips could generate enough power to run small health monitoring devices. For example, mm. my little super inexpensive wise uh, watch, which I couldn't resist for 20 bucks, you know, it has the uh, heart rate and the blood oxygen and all that kind of stuff. And this is something in the milliwatt range. So maybe something like this could help health patients with special monitoring equipment. Who knows? Maybe they'll have one of those little band-aid dudes on four fingers doing four different devices or something. You know, you get well, the picture. Yeah, and <laughs> and uh, I I wanted to you know kind of put milliwatt uh, into perspective. And, you know yes, what really yes. powers in that range, and um, you know just a quick Google search showed that laser pointers. I don't know. You know maybe mm. laser pointers would be useful for some situations. Uh, mm. Use about five milliwatts of power, but then there's also hearing aids which take less than one uh, milliwatt good one to do good. that so hey maybe yes. some kind of system to uh you know kind of work it into everyday clothing or you know in this case the you know the bandage wouldn't be too hard either and be able to power things like hearing aids i mean that would be very cool maybe yeah maybe that's very interesting it, to power the hearing aid what would be ideal is if the, the skin maybe behind your ear or something i don't would know how enough. much maybe sweat does enough that they they the fingertips are particularly good because again of a thousand plus um, sweat glands you have in each fingertip, which is just blows my, still blows my mind, but it gives me a good excuse for my slimy fingerprints. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, and, and, and really, I, I mean, you know, maybe even just having a glove that you could slip on and be able to, uh, you know, kind of have uh, this here and as an emergency, you know, to kind of power things uh, for a little bit. Hey, maybe uh, I had like the fact that they're able to, and, you know, building off of their previous research, um, I, 
I think I read there that they had a previous research where they were getting power from a tattoo. Um, you know, that mm. was what UC mm. uh, uh, San Diego was working on before. But now, instead of a temporary tattoo, they're doing a, a, a bandage strip. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it, like it's really cool to see idea. what they're doing. I like your glove idea because maybe you could aggregate. Let's take the four fingers here. What yeah. if you had a, a glove that could take the energy from each fingertip and combine it somehow so you could drive even more yeah uh, and then of power. course there you, you you put a little reactor there and you shoot laser beams <laughs> and you get your own movie deal with Disney it, it, it's great <laughs> it, it, it's a wonderful idea uh, <laughs> might not happen that way but but still being able to further the research and say you know temporary yes, tattoo is yes, one thing yes. adhesive yes. strip a whole nother this is uh, yes. very very cool uh, yeah Yep. So story number one, story number two, and um, <laughs> Rob, I, I I don't know how much um, you watch stand up comedy. You know, maybe you're a big fan. I a don't little know. bit. Uh, yeah, Jim Gaffigan uh, on, is my favorite. <laughs> uh, J- Jim Gaffigan is amazing. Uh, he, he was he, he was actually on the show uh, a, a, a oh, while no ago kidding. with Craig. How wonderful! Yeah, oh, how yeah. Uh, and actually, Craig's in the chat room. I'm sure Craig can remember. Uh, I I think he was plugging a tour, but yeah, he came on just to not talk oh, about technology, yeah. but just to have fun. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And but but yeah. So Jim Gaffigan, I never had the pleasure of meeting him, but uh, no. Uh, Bo Burnham. I don't know if you ever heard of him. He's kind of a younger guy. Uh-huh. Um, he has a special on Netflix that can get, you know, kind of borderlines, kind of depressing and excited and manic, very critically <laughs> well received. It is, it, it is a, uh, one of the most profound kind of stand up uh, shows. Mm. Like, like it's not even like one routine. Mm. He, he did it over the course of COVID in quarantine. Mm. So he spent like eight months doing all the, all the cinematography himself. Anyway, oh, wow. he had a song in there about Jeff Bezos and pretty much disclaiming <laughs> that he won capitalism. Like he, he did it. He beat the system. Uh, he won <laughs> capitalism. So Jeff Bezos has so much money; it's almost unfathomable how much yes. money this this guy has. Yes. And I guess yes. when you have that, you get to you know kind of lead and start projects that are rather fun, including space exploration, of course. And yes. you know, and and don't get me wrong, Jeff Bezos, Ralph. I also don't know if you know this; he is also the most philanthropic person on Earth. Of course, he you know by the numbers, he gave the most money. Maybe not by percentage, but you know, just flat dollar amount. He gave dollar the most amounts, money yeah. to philanthropic endeavors. Uh, he also has the most, but you know, hey, uh, you do as there you, you do. go. <laughs> this one though, not quite philanthropic, but rather weird. I don't know why he did this. Yes, exactly. When I did this story recently with Mark Mason on KEX Radio, he he said, "Ralph, time out. Why?" So, folks, <laughs> what we're talking about, the headline of what we're talking about is Jeff Bezos is building a ten thousand year clock inside a mountain. And I got this from Popular Mechanics. Actually, my son-in-law, Brian Busby, turned me out of this story. So thanks, Brian. A story Mm -hmm. by Caroline Delbert. And so we'll go through this and then just we can all scratch our heads together. Okay. So (laughs) Jeff Bezos, Amazon founder, of course, and his scientist friend, Danny Hillis, are building a massive multi-room clock inside a mountain on Bezos's property in West Texas that will tell time for the next 10,000 years. Okay. Danny Hillis, a visiting professor at the MIT Media Lab, is a computer scientist who first imagined this idea for a 10,000-year clock way back in 1986. The clock is designed to tick just once a year and chime once per millennium. Oh, wow. Hmm. According to Bezos, the clock will be 500 feet tall and will be all mechanical and powered by day and night thermal cycles and will synchronize uh, at solar noon. And I went, solar noon? I had to find out what that is. So I did a little research. Solar noon is the moment when the sun passes a location's meridian and reaches its highest position in the sky. Now, what I didn't realize is in most cases, it doesn't happen at the 12 o'clock point on our watches and clocks. So our of course. time system is not necessarily perfectly lined up with the literal noon or highest point of the sun in the sky in your day. So <laughs> that was kind of interesting. But again, you, you know, okay, it's 10,000 year clock. Obviously, Jeff is probably not going to be around uh, or any of us for that matter. And you just have to wonder, is it just to prove that you could do it or or 
what <laughs> well and, and and uh so so obviously uh there's a lot of scientific reasons to do this and and, and they mentioned uh, a visiting pro- uh, professor with the MIT media lab uh right. you know the ability to tell very minute fractions of time and be able well, to do that you uh, you know super important for science but also uh Maybe maybe it really is just something to inspire people, you know, to go look at. I don't know if this is going to be done, uh, you know, as like a tourist destination that people can go look at this. Um, you know, this idea mm-hmm. has Fine. come up before, and uh, actually, hey, you know, I actually know that name. So I found this Wikipedia article, uh, "Clock of the Long Now." This is oh, in the Science you. Museum in London. Cool. And oh it's, yeah, it's very similar. Uh, and actually, by the way. Uh, Oh, and, and actually it mentions in this one here as well, uh, the manufacture and site construction of the first full-scale prototype clock. So this was the prototype that began working December 31st, oh, 1999 got it. in the Science Museum of London. And they even have a, uh, you know, kind of a quote here cool. uh, uh, by Danny Hillis. Sound familiar? Uh, there it is. And yeah, so it looks like Jeff Bezos uh, kind of ran with the idea and has invested $42 million to see it so done. So far. <laughs> So far, <laughs> yeah. So far, that's uh, uh, you Isn't know, and, 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 and as to you and your, you know, and as to you and your colleague, um, as to the why, I mean, someone's going to have a reason for this. But it, it's also, Ralph. I feel like you know, we all look at our phones. We you know, we count the minutes, we count the seconds. There's also something rather introspective about you know a clock that ticks every ten, you know, every one thousand years. Like that, that's a t- that's a measurement of time that people just cannot think in because hey, you know our time yeah. is only what a couple of decades, hundred years or so. Um, yeah, you know if you're lucky, like if you're lucky, <laughs> really incredible. So I'm I'm glad that yeah. they're able to do this full scale and fun story. What do you say five hundred <laughs> feet tall? Yeah. What What do you think about the day and night thermal cycles? Like, like he mentioned, all mechanical and powered by day and night thermal cycles. I would love um, to know more about that. That yeah. would be fun to research and find out what's that all about. That, that's <laughs> nice that they didn't have to, uh, you know, kind of uh, wire up Put the mountain big, to, to get this. To yeah, work. or have some external generators, or maybe they could have done solar power. Or something. Who knows? But the fact that it's just working off of uh, thermal day I'm and guessing, night cycles is pretty interesting. I'm Heat guessing exchange that. Of kind of, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that they really wanted all mechanical because they want this thing to run for, you know, 10,000 years. Uh, yes. If you, you know, when you start to introduce electronics and outside power, there hey, you go. You know, there's no guarantee. So excellent point. <laughs> very, very cool. Uh, Ra- Ralph, I don't know what you would do with $42 million, but uh, that's one way to spend it. So you, know, you can go ahead and chalk that up to your, uh, you know, to your list. Build massive clocks in mountains. <laughs> There, it there is. you go. <laughs> Always fun. Story number three and yes. uh, yeast and uh, so way back in in, in in another job where I was a pharmaceutical manufacturer, one uh-huh. of the big parts of that whole process was, of course, you you're you know you pay it by companies to make this product, and you know you mix chemicals, you go through the process, mm-hmm. and you get the end result. Uh, yep. Where those companies kind of made their side money, Ralph. I don't know if you know this. So like you know what kind of separated the failing companies from the successful companies was yep. you take the waste, the byproduct, the useless stuff that the client would just say, get rid of it, dispose of it. And if your chemist, if your engineers could find a way to take trash and turn that into a marketable sellable product you were a successful company yep i love that you know not a lot of people think about that where you know you think oh it's just trash it's just useless it's compost it's it's you know just a byproduct you don't need that right that's where the real innovation needs to happen because that reduces everything and it makes everything better so story number three i really love stuff like this yeah this is a good one headline for story three is a new Modified yeast can make ethanol from corn stalks and other leftovers. This comes from sciencenews.com, a story by Nick Ogasa. And so, of course, we're all familiar with ethanol fuel made from corn kernels. But what about the rest of the plant as a source of biofuel? So when corn farmers harvest their crop, they sometimes, not always, they sometimes leave the stalks and leaves to rot in the field. But Drum roll, please. Now, 
Engineers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology have developed a new strain of yeast that can convert this corn plant waste also into ethanol. And previous efforts to convert corn plant waste into fuel had very limited success. That's because existing yeast could only start the process of converting corn plant waste into ethanol. The problem was that when existing yeast started to break down the corn plant waste, the process itself often generated byproducts that would kill the yeast. So it was like a death loop. Mm -hmm. But here, I love this part. You're going to love this. But by tweaking a gene in common baker's yeast, common mm. baker's yeast, you love this. MIT scientists have engineered a strain that can diffuse those deadly byproducts and get on with the job of turning the sugar in the corn plant waste into ethanol. However, the researchers were very truth transparent. They said, we need many, many more improvements are needed before this technology becomes commercially viable. But if it does, how cool is that? I mean, the entire corn plant can help make ethanol, which is just another step in helping promote biofuels. Of course. And, and though I do want to give farmers credit because, you know, when they say, you know, just leaving the the, the husk and the corn stalks in the field to rot, uh, that's also adding back in nutrients. Like, fa like farming well, is so scientific, Ralph, that I feel like there's nothing that nowadays. they kind of do just by accident. Right. Um, yes, that's right. So, yeah, I'm sure they're trying to reintroduce, you know, minerals and different materials back into the soil. But yeah, you know, but really if your point of growing this corn is to make ethanol and you can increase your yield of ethanol that's always a, a positive thing so you got I love it. stories like this and uh yeah really happy that you, you found that ralph i would have never found that in a million years doing doing the show here every day like we do so it's, that's uh, what i do dig for the obscure <laughs> definitely definitely so that was uh well hey actually speaking of uh digging uh, you have one here that, uh, well, it travels, a, let's see, it's a passenger pod that travels above ground. So I guess not so much digging, but yeah, story number four. Yeah. So this comes from CNN Business, a story by Anna D. Olivia. Um, the headline is new high speed driverless passenger pods that travel above ground could help cities solve traffic congestion. And if nothing else, you have to see the show notes to see the pictures of this uh, prototype. But here's the story. A Belarus-based company called U-Sky Transport recently opened a 400-meter experimental line of all-electric driverless passenger pods in the United Arab Emirates that can travel up to 93 miles per hour suspended above ground mm. on cables. The four passenger electrically powered prototype pods offer luxurious interiors as the photograph d definitely shows the and they include yeah. Go ahead, man. Yeah, uh, yeah ahead. I, I, was, I was just gonna say that the uh, you know the the first photo that you have in the show notes is, is kind of misleading because like the way that the shadow and the sand and you know kind of everything there right. looks, it looks like it's just sitting on the ground. But of course, now I can see there's that tightrope that it's uh, yep. you know the cable, balls. right? I yeah. gotcha. I gotcha. So so these crazy luxurious like super first class interiors include mood lighting, music, and floor to ceiling windows. <laughs> Pretty cool. And the U Sky transport team claims that a citywide network of their suspended pods could support up to 10,000 passengers per hour. And according to U Sky transport, one kilometer of subway underground, of course, can cost up to $150 million to construct. And they say their above ground pod transport system costs around $10 million per kilometer to build. So there's a, a cost attractiveness to this. It may not be the answer for what all a bargain. Of cities. <laughs> yeah. But my wife, my wife pointed out when she saw this story in my notes, she said, oh, this reminds me of, I think it's a Disney World in Florida. Uh, they just put it, it's a gondola like system that goes between a couple of their resorts. Uh, I think it's not high speed, no, but it's a pretty cool system. Uh, Disney and uh, why do I keep on saying Space Mountain? It, 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 it's in their like kind of future future world mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, place. Yeah, I, I've, 
I've actually ridden it, and it, it is uh, uh, it's in Future World near Epcot and stuff like that. Uh, I'm trying cool. to think of what it's actually called, but yeah, uh, it's fun. It, it's all well and good, but also I'm sure that you know, just like Subway has its own considerations. I'm sure that this one is, uh, yeah, you know, you're taking up headspace. I don't know, but please continue. Could be, could be. So this is interesting, and then. I really like story number five because one of the things, you know, there are certain things, by the way, I digress for just a moment here. Uh, the story about the ethanol, one of the things over the last, I'd say, almost year and a half, I've become increasingly aware of and kind of gravitating more and more to agri-tech, agricultural technology mm-hmm. stories. Because that's a, if you think farming is boring, friends, eh. <laughs> there is astonishing science, amazing efforts going into trying to make our uh, production better and to get the most out of our farming. I'll stop there. To but be the fair. other thing that's to be fair, the, there it is. The other thing that's super close to my heart, no pun intended, in my case, is anything to do with medical technology breakthroughs. And this story number five, the headline is new, battery-free, wireless cardiac pacemaker. Wait for it dissolves after treatment. Okay. This comes from medgadget.com, mm-hmm. a story by Con Hastings. Got a video there, a link and so forth, and a great illustration in the show notes. So here's the story, uh, Ben. A team of researchers headed up by scientists at Northwestern University has developed a temporary cardiac cardiac pardon me, pacemaker that dissolves away in the body, turning into harmless byproducts. This new technology is also wireless and battery-free and can be safely sealed into the body with no need for later removal. Yay. Mm -hmm. And this wireless breakthrough eliminates the need by default to have lead wires poking out of a patient's skin. Yay. That's another good thing. The current prototype of this new pacemaker is thin and flexible and lasts for approximately five to seven weeks before breaking down into biocompatible byproducts that are eventually harmlessly excreted from the body. It also offers the option to tweak the formulation and structure of the device to precisely control how long it takes to dissolve. This allows doctors to customize the device to meet the needs of each patient. Wow. And to eliminate the need for a battery, the new device uses an external antenna to provide wireless energy transmitted to the dissolvable pacemaker. Bravo. Mm. I just think this is really innovative, really clever. Yeah. And and I'm guessing that they're able to kind of vary how long they want it to last by whatever kind of coding that they, you know, kind of put over it. They can thicken the coding or, you know, kind of uh, make it less. Yeah, it would be Uh, interesting to know. Yeah, and, and of course, Ralph, I'm I'm guessing it's a good thing that they don't have to go in twice into your chest to uh, you know to yes. deal with hearts. Yes. Oh, uh, yes. This is this is for people who have had any. I have not had any experience with pacemakers yet, <laughs> but, but but wow. I mean, it's just I think it's great. Yep, it, it's uh, you know, and there's always this. Uh, th- there were stories in the past. I don't know if we covered them with you or if we covered them here. Uh, you know, just on the show where they had pacemakers that are always in people's bodies, and you know, obviously there's go- always going to be people who need them permanently. But mm-hmm, to mm-hmm, have them in there mm-hmm. and you know have them controlled by outside sources, like uh, you know, kind of internet controlled, and people were getting concerned about hacking them and you know making mm-hmm. people's hearts stop. Uh, stuff like mm-hmm. that like i'm i'm curious if you know this is something that will make the surgery safer as we head into a world where you know more and more of these medical devices get connected to each other i mean if eventually hey you know they just dissolve and they go away that makes everything safer uh, like there's so many different angles to take this from but i'm i'm happy that they're working on less invasive surgery because obviously yes. getting in there is one time is bad enough having to get in there twice would be even worse so, so that is cool that is definitely cool I, like that. Uh, I I I am curious though what a wireless antenna or uh, what the external antenna means. Like, does that mean that there's still one wire at least sticking out of you for the power source? You know, like as a antenna. They claim um, no. So I'm I'm with you. I, I would like hmm. to know more. Ma- maybe that means that works. you have to wear something kind of like near it on your chest to power it. That it, could be. That, that could be. Maybe maybe maybe. So yeah, that could be. Yep. So, but, but of course, you know, just having a device on your chest for five weeks is much better than the alternative, I would imagine. So, Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Not 
bad, not bad. So story number five, story number six. And I'm so... So, Rob, I, I have heard of the story. Um, I'm I'm glad that you are updating us, and I'm sure a lot of people have oh, cool. not heard of the story. Um, I'm, you know, from all the hurdles that they were talking about, no one thought that this was going to get anywhere. So, I'm really excited to hear about an update about this project. Yeah. So, the headline here is a Dutch company has created snap-together road modules made with recycled plastic. And, friends, this comes from Redshift. Dot com, which comes from Autodesk, where I spent the last 10 years or so of my career. I just love it. And the story here by Friedrich Voigt. And uh, if you think con- the construction industry is old school and boring and just hammers and nails, uh-uh. technology, 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 I'm telling you, it's amazing. So please get to know redshift.com and start learning about the excitement of technology and construction. That's another thing I like. So here's the story. A Dutch startup called Plastic Road, good name, is now producing prototype sustainable roads made out of recycled plastic. I love this, new ways to use recycled plastic, right? The Plastic Road team claims, as compared to traditional asphalt roads, their modular plastic roads are easier to maintain, can fully manage flooding, can be recycled as needed up to seven times. And a roadway made with the company's plastic road sections is also four times lighter than traditional asphalt roads, is 70% faster to build, and lasts three times longer than an asphalt road and produces up to 72% fewer carbon emissions in the process of construction than conventional roads. Each modular prefabricated lane section contains nearly 2,200 pounds of recycled plastic. That equals about 218,000 plastic cups, for example. And building a roadway with these plastic modular section requires no intensive excavation work, no heavy foundations, and no environmentally detrimental concrete slabs or layers of asphalt. And with this technology, this is the part that's fun. Assembling the road is like playing with Lego bricks. It takes just a few clicks after a module section is lowered into place to Mm -hmm. connect it to another section. And they have two pilot projects right now going on, uh, proof of concept projects, a pair of bicycle paths built in two Dutch towns. They're now using this to demonstrate what they contend are the benefits of this innovative and sustainable alternative to traditional road construction. So, I just there's so many things about this story that click for me in terms of being cool, not least of which another way to reuse uh, plastic, which I think is kind of cool. Yeah, and, and and I definitely like how they are, you know, kind of gearing it more for like bike bike paths at the moment. I'm sure that it could handle trucks and stuff. Although even in their own product image, they kind of have a truck uh, driving parallel to it, you know, not on it. So right. you know, I'm sure that this is more for a pedestrian path. Ralph, uh, you know, being able to store water and be able to lay those lines and have constant yeah. access to it. I mean, it makes so much sense, but. I'm glad that they're doing testing because, Ralph, uh, I, I, oh, I don't yeah. know if you recall another story uh, that I believe you brought to us back in like 2014, 2015, mm-hmm. where a company said that they wanted to make roads out of a tough, durable plastic, but then they also wanted to uh, embed solar cells into them so that each oh, roadway yeah, yeah. would be a you know would be a power generator, gigantic but, panel, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a, you know, so you could imagine that you know, um, if every road in the United States was also a solar panel, we'd have wow. a lot of electricity. Um, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, but you know, but that one, uh, we didn't hear anything more from that because, as I understand it, as trucks drove on it, it uh, made it very dirty, and the energy efficiency plummeted. Like they had to be cleaned yeah. constantly to get that kind of thing. Yeah, so that I'm makes glad sense. that they're. Uh, doing tests on this whole thing. Uh, I do like the modular design click together. Uh, you know, not saying that, uh, you know, kind of road crews don't know what they're doing, but to be able to implement these quickly. And I think that's the most important part. You know, prefab quick production is super yeah. important. So, yeah. I like this. I, I I like it a lot. Um, you know, everything from the recycling angle to the sustainability angle. There's a lot to like in this article. I can see why you uh, why you were yeah. you know picked it up. Yep. Very very nice. Story number seven. Let's go ahead and uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get to it. Well, story number seven is kind of like 
chapter two of a story we started back in May, and I'll explain in a moment. Here's the headline. Severely paralyzed man communicates using brain signals sent to his vocal tract. And this comes from Engadget.com, a story by Steve Dent. And we've got a video and link here for you. So back in May, we talked about an amazing technology that allowed a severely paralyzed man to write individual letters, so to speak, one at a time on a computer screen using only his thoughts. But that was one letter at a time, right? And I think at the time we said it was like 15 words per minute was the average that this person could do. But again, one letter at a time. Now, a severely paralyzed man can communicate using a new technology breakthrough that translates signals from his brain directly to his vocal track. In other words, it's intercepting those those, uh, signals Hmm. to generate full words, not just letter at a time, full words on a screen developed by neuro prosthetic technology researchers at the University of California, San Francisco. The technique is a more natural way, of course, for people with speech loss to communicate than other methods developed to date. Again, going back to the one character at a time. Here's how it works. The system uses an implant that's placed directly on the part of the brain dedicated to speech. The paralyzed subject can then mentally activate the brain patterns they would normally use to say a word. That alone could be tons of research and interesting stuff going on there. The system then translates the entire word rather than single letters in real time and displays the words on a computer screen. So another, like I say, chapter two or step two in the building story that we started in May, I just thought this was inspired. I'm, I'm wondering how that's more effective. And uh, because Ralph, it seems like they, again, are intercepting those signals that they would normally go to uh, the vocal cords to make the words like you just said. I'm curious how that's uh, different than, uh, you know, because I, I don't know how many words the average human knows, you know, maybe it's one or two million or, you know, maybe a couple million words, Uh, maybe having a different, you know, kind of brain signal pattern for each word isn't exactly feasible. Uh, I'm wondering how, how, you know, kind of how many different words can you identify just by the pattern that you would send to your vocal cords, you know, just by reading that pattern, instead of saying, think about a word and we'll map that out. It's think about saying a word and we'll map that out I'm, uh, yeah no, you, you raise a really this? good point it may it's a cool story it they didn't have any qualifiers like today it's only a hundred words or it's only mm-hmm. you know the 200 most common used words there was no qualifier like this but you raise a very good point how could it possibly in a way uh well i don't know we, we need further research <laughs> yeah I, well it, and and it could also be just the fact that um you know everyone thinks differently but yet we all pronounce the same words the same way you know we still we all say uh you know uh, we all say advertisement the same way there, there's no other way to say those words or aluminium <laughs> you know we we all say them exactly the same or innovative I, I, <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 exactly. So I'm wondering if it's the act of saying a word is the, you know, kind of the universal connector, you know, between most people uh, versus, you know, how our brains are structured to think about different words, yes. because that might be, yes. you know, wired a little bit differently. I well, and you know what? I wonder if there, and it wasn't in the article, if there's a training process for the patient. Uh, I would imagine. Where, but, absolutely. Yeah. So, that, so maybe that could be part of the answer of how this is, is achieved. Yeah, yeah uh, of course. And and I guess the and, and judging by a lot of our guests over the past couple of months, Ralph, uh, if you don't know, AI is becoming a huge thing yeah, in, in the world. Like every everyone yes, is using yes. AI in some way, yep. uh, even yep. if it is just yep. a market to customers. Um, yeah. But but yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah. AI and <laughs> I guess the dream is that for now, researchers are working with individual patients, I'm sure, to train these algorithms and get them working. Right. The future, right. I guess, would be if everyone could install their own, train their own, and then be able mm-hmm. to have the mm-hmm. machine learn how to talk to you instead of you having mm-hmm. to talk to the machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of potential. And and I do like this. Again, I, I, I'm, I'm just kind of curious why they decided to, you know, kind of go go the roundabout way instead of mapping out words in the brain why do they go mapping out co- you know vocal cords or vocal signals from the brain about words it's uh it's, it, it, it's fun yeah it's it definitely is. Is. <laughs> um 
the and 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 I uh, before we get to the next one, I just, one more point, Ralph, is of course that if they were able to shrink that down, because you know the video didn't put uh, didn't put that uh, idea into my brain that they're going to shrink it down anytime soon. Because if you look at the diagram uh, where they kind of zoom out here, yes. like yes, it's essentially a patient sitting next to a server rack. Like it it is a lot of computational power that needs to happen oh, to I get this sure. to happen at all. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, not exactly shrink down and put onto a smartphone app kind of thing. But it's a start. But it's a start, and maybe one day, you know, we'll be able to bypass any kind of breakdown there is and just implant this, and then people will just be able to talk, you know, because that's yes. that's really what they're trying to do, Ralph, is just, you know, yeah. uh, they would be able to stimulate the vocal cords to have people who could not talk start to talk. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's, uh, there's, yeah. It's, it's good, good stuff. It's one, again, another example of sort of medical technology, which again is story eight onward more medical it. related stuff <laughs> so story it. eight the headline is oscillating magnetic field shrinks a brain tumor and the image is unintentionally kind of comical this helmet and so forth friends if you're it able looks to see like the, the beer show hats. Notes, it looks like one of thank you i kept thinking what does this look like those crazy hats you have with the beer cans and the tubes that go, yeah. yes okay i get it you've perfect word picture there <laughs> so this comes from medgadget.com a story by con hastings so here's the story at the houston methodist neurological institute researchers developed a headset device again it looks like on a beer helmet that generates a magnetic field that successfully shrank i hope i'm saying this right g geloblastoma brain tumor in a patient volunteer it's a type of brain tumor that's basically lights out fatal okay mm -hmm. uh and the glio or G glio glioblastoma you got it am i saying that right glio glioblastoma, glioblastoma is a yep. brain cancer with a very poor prognosis as i alluded to a moment ago which nearly always proves to be fatal well almost always the device the researchers created is worn on the head each day during treatment and uses an oscillating magnetic field to, to, to disrupt biochemical processes in cancer cells and kill them. While the device is in its infancy, the first inhuman test of this particular type of device shows promise and could herald the first steps in a new non-invasive treatment process. There's the ding, ding, ding. The magnetic fields can be applied through a wearable headset, which also helps to ensure the treatment is localized near the glio. Can I keep yep, stumbling on it. this? We'll just say the tumor, glioblastoma tumor. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also means the patients can administer the therapy themselves at home. Ding, ding, ding. Yeah. The device consists of three oscillators attached to the helmet. In the first inhuman test of the new device, a 53-year-old uh, glioblastoma patient used the device regularly. Unfortunately, the patient died after a month. Ding, nothing to do with his treatment. He died after a month of treatment from an unrelated injury. All right? Nothing to do with his treatment. But, and here's where the promising trend part comes in, uh, autopsy of this poor fellow found that the treatment had shrunk the brain tumor in question, the target, by 31%. Had this person not had this unrelated injury and died as a result, maybe it could have gotten rid of the tumor completely. So they're optimistic. We'll see. Uh, for, you know, and, and really, from my understanding, when it comes to people who are dealing with really deadly diseases, um, Ralph, it, it, it's really like... In some ways, it's really hard to find people because especially when they kind of get rare and they mentioned this is a rare, deadly form of cancer. Uh, mm -hmm. It's rare. So it's hard to find people who are suitable, uh, you know, kind of uh, clinical trial participants right. to work with you. Right. But also, I think that some, you know, uh, I've heard that some of the best, uh, you know, kind of participants are people that feel like they really don't have any more options you know it's like it's this or you know kind of uh, traditional stuff that hasn't really worked i'm sure yep. that if they find more people they can get people to keep trying this because you know again it sounds like it's kind of an all or nothing kind of proposition that they have here um i'm i i would love to see more people try this more people of course react positively to this 
magnets have always been one of those things, Ralph, that's like, they're so powerful. And at the same time, they're, they're, they're simple yet complicated. Like I've explained them on the show and mm. I'm not even a hundred percent sure that I could repeat everything that I've explained before. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm I'm curious what it does to cancer. I I know it says here that, you know, uh, in your notes, it said that it uh, oscillated magnetic field to disrupt biochemical processes in cancer cells. Um, I'm, I, I, I guess as long as there's no other damage to any other brain tissue or anything like that. I was just going to say, how does it, how does it target just the tumor? Well, uh, yeah. And and, and they said that, you know, um, the, you know, to 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 our point, you know, we, we were kind of joking that it looks like a beer hat, uh, but I'm guessing that those those canisters, you know, the, in that model can be moved closer to like, you know, that particular part. So it's not like you're putting your head in a microwave or anything like that. Uh, yeah, uh, right. Yeah, it's <laughs> uh, very curious um, and you love to see new research like that. So very, very cool. Uh, yeah. Story number eight. Story number nine. Again, from CNN. Yes, this is fun. And this goes back to my avocation that you find out about construction technology today, folks, which is not boring, not boring. So number nine, world's first commercial. (laughs) Yeah, the Dutch again. World's first commercial housing project based on 3D concrete printing comes from CNN. Really interesting story. The pictures here. Now, the house itself is kind of looks like an Adobe like structure. It's 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 kind of interesting looking. It may not be everybody's idea of an attractive home, but that, that's not the point. The point is this process of making this thing. I think yeah. it's kind of cool. I, I like it. I could see this in New Mexico or something like that. It could be really cool. <laughs> All right. So a couple in Holland are the owners of what is claimed to be the world's first home in a commercial housing project that was created using 3D concrete printing. So they're not saying this is the first home ever made with 3D concrete printing, but the first home in a you know, a good size commercial housing project. So it's take, the point is, is taking this technology to a more um, large scale deployment, if you will, in a commercial housing project. So the single story, 1000 square foot house, so it's not gigantic, is the first home created for Project Milestone, which is a joint construction project from the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. So like you said, the Dutch again here, the 3D printed home consists of 24 concrete elements or modules that were connected together on site. Each component or element was was printed layer by layer at a factory in Eindhoven. The factory-based computer-guided large scale, and we're talking large scale, 3D printer consists of a huge robot with a mechanical arm that can move on a track in seven different directions to lay mortar in a pattern on a print bed. That's how you make each one of the modules. The entire uh, home modular components took only 120 hours to print. And once printed, and cured, of course, the modular house elements were transported by truck to the building site and assembled on a foundation. So they did have to create a foundation uh, first. So there was some more traditional uh, work there. But I, I just think, again, the point of the story is 3D printing of some smaller scale buildings has been around for a while. That's, that's nothing new. The significance here is the first attempt to really go on a larger scale commercial housing project approach uh, for this technology. What, which do you think it, you know, kind of has more practical, I guess, kind of ability? And, and I feel completely comfortable asking you this because, you know, of your work with Autodesk. Um, right. You know, when it comes to this, like, so they have uh, 24 concrete elements or modules. So I guess that means, you know, everything from a flat wall to a curved wall to a roofing part, you know, yes. to the part that connects right. the roof to the wall. So, right. you know, 24 different modules. Think about like 24 different Legos versus Ralph, yes. some of the stuff that we've seen in the past where they have uh you know they construct the apparatus on site instead of a factory like they did here and they kind of map it all out with you know autocad and you know kind of 3d uh, sure. software and then just have the print head essentially print your house on site which do you think is is you know going to have more application in the future because you know both seem to have very obvious positives and negatives uh Personally, I would imagine that being able to print everything on site seamlessly uh, would have more application, uh, you know, just to me. Well, I don't know. I'll offer this. I, I, I think I'll take it from uh, an architectural engineering and construction point of view from my years at Autodesk. Y- yes, you're right. In terms of 
a seamless structural, if you want to call it integrity, I guess, or just the, the idea of bringing the uh, 3D printing robot system, the, the concrete extru- mm-hmm. extruder or mortar on site is, is fine and dandy. But when you think about the logistics of bringing all that equipment on site, and so on and so forth, as opposed to knocking out in a factory modules that can then be transported and, and assembled, mm-hmm. I think democratizes, it, it democratizes 3D house or building printing uh, much more than the very elaborate process of having to go and set up the equipment in the field. Are you so, saying that's that just not everyone like, lives in the middle of a parking lot that would be suitable <laughs> for a giant 3D printer to be well, constructed? And speaking of parking lots and our terrible homeless problem which is absolutely horrifying in the portland metro area it's just Mm -hmm. it looks like a a dystopian science fiction movie these days it's tragic but my point is if you can construct quickly uh acceptable safe housing using this kind of technology and assemble these components in a large parking lot or something that they're now doing tents in to try to help these homeless folks here in oregon uh, this could be maybe another way to get uh, permanent structures more quickly. I, you know, there's all kinds of possibilities. Yep. And, and of course, you know, more to your uh, point, there's a lot of places, you know, here at home and of course abroad that uh, that was one of the first ways that we uh, that we heard about this, you know, through you, of course, uh, about 3D printing was that, you know, they wanted to 3D print or kind of make these little um, kind of one Bed, you know, not one bedroom, but kind of one one room domed housing yeah. that would take yeah. like you know just like a day to put up, and they would last through hurricane. They were hurricane, and this was I think near uh, what happened in Haiti. Um, oh, you know, and they okay. were trying to think about how to rebuild, huh. and they were like they need to rebuild with things that will actually survive. You know, the elements, and that was the first time that we heard about three D printing these buildings, mm. and it was little dome homes. Um, yeah, yeah, igloo so, like things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, uh, you know, super important. And of course, it seems like, Ralph, I, I you know, and I've said it on, before on the show, technology has caused a lot of problems. But I also feel like technology is going to be the thing that brings us out of these problems. Um, you know, as, as much as we're dealing with global warming and all that kind of stuff, like, I really do feel like the answer is, you know, some kind of scrubbing system or, you know, something else that's going to happen. Technology is not the bad guy, and it, it has so yeah. much power to help so many people. So, yeah. We, we and with that in mind, Ben, if, if I may suggest, oh, I'm sorry, Ben, if looking at the clock here, uh, maybe if you don't mind, could we jump to story 12? Because in terms of being encouraged about technology helping us solve problems, I think story Absolutely. 12 is Absolutely. Really we can definitely cool. start jumping around. Yeah. Story 12. Yeah. So, story 12 from Sci Tech Daily. Uh, and also kind of uh, spins off of an announcement from the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. The headline, a cousin of table salt could make rechargeable batteries faster and safer. And specifically, they're talking about the batteries that are in our uh, electronic vehicles or, my, or like my, my plug-in hybrid, which has one battery for a traditional hybrid and one battery dedicated for all EV mode at the beginning up to about 45, 50 miles. Yep. Anywho, um, this, this one, this is the thing. Yes, science, technology has created problems. But if I want to put my money on who's going to dig us out of climate mm-hmm. change, who's going to get us out of this horrible mess, it's science. So anyway, one of the biggest factors, of course, affecting consumer adoption of electrical vehicles is the amount of time required to recharge the vehicles, usually powered by lithium ion batteries. My plug-in hybrid, for example, the, the pure hy- or pure electric battery only, takes 12 hours on a regular, you know, plug in kind of deal. Yes. So it can take a few hours to overnight to recharge your EVs battery. Everybody knows that if you have one of these cars, today's rechargeable lithium ion batteries change, pardon me, charge only at slower controlled rates, which is a safety feature to help prevent fires and even explosions. Yikes. Recently, Researchers from the University of California, San Diego, here comes UCSD again, worked with scientists at Oak Ridge National Laboratory to find a better solution, potentially. Okay, now this gets very geeky. Okay, this is above (laughs) my pay grade, believe me, but here we go. They conducted 
they conducted, pardon me, neutron scattering experiments on a new type of material that could be used to make safer, faster charging lithium ion batteries. The researchers produced uh, samples of lithium van vanadium, I hope I'm saying that right, oxide, which is a disordered rock salt. You'll get this disordered in a moment, similar to table salt but with a certain degree of randomness in the arrangement of its atoms, hence disordered, okay? During testing, the rock salt anode material was able to deliver more than 40% of its energy capacity in just 20 seconds after uh, voltage charging. So again, this is nascent early, early, early research, right? But the, the implication is this incredibly fast charging capability of this approach using this disordered rock salt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the rapid charging and discharging appears possible because the rock salt material can rapidly cycle two lithium, lithium pardon me, ions in and out of vacant sites within its crystal structure. So again, super geeky. I don't pretend to understand this fully but I'm certainly thrilled to see something might be around the corner that's going to make charging so vastly faster than it is today. So, and whenever we uh, talk about batteries and, you know, um, I did a whole segment on batteries. One of the reasons why things take so long to charge Ralph is, and I'm sure that you know this, uh, this is for everyone else, not Ralph, uh, but it's <laughs> the longer something takes to charge, the longer it takes to discharge, which is very helpful for things like your phones and things like that. You know, you can make a capacitor that charges in tw you know, in two seconds, but of course then it uh, releases all of its energy in two seconds, you know, and you know, when it comes to things like phones and cars, we want these things to discharge, you know, kind of slowly. We want them to keep their battery, you know, to last all day long. Right. Um, right. This disordered rock salt and, you know, kind of uh, there during the test, rocks uh, was able to deliver 40% of his energy in just 20 seconds of after voltage charging. Um, this disordered randomness, Ralph, that they're kind of talking about here, uh, I don't know everything about it, but it seems like it's a good way to kind of get that fast, immediate charge. And it's going to last longer than capacitors. Like I said, that, you know, two seconds, two seconds. Uh, but you know, when I did that segment on lithium ion batteries, Ralph, like there's mm -hmm. a reason why lithium ion has been around for so long. It's that it's just the perfect battery. It is so amazingly perfect. I'm glad that they're trying to innovate on it, uh, but I feel like this is going to be used in conjunction with a lot of lithium ion batteries. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. it's going to be for that short term, you know, kind of boost. And if they can get this to work, you know, minutes on minutes uh, instead of seconds on seconds, this has a lot yeah. of potential, but it's also not going to replace lithium ion, but it, it's exciting stuff and very, very cool. Yeah. And if you don't mind, how about we do story 13 with a little bit of time we have left here Absolutely. real quick. Absolutely. I think we can hit it for sure. This is another agritech story, folks. You see, this is where my brain's been at lately. Headline, new fully autonomous AI powered beehive system actually could help save bee colonies. A story from Forbes by Jennifer Kite Powell. Here we go. We'll make this quick. With 35% global annual decline of bee colonies. Oh my God that supports 75% of the world's crops. We're facing an immediate worldwide and serious threat to the global food supply. No, duh. To help save bee colonies, BeeWise, an agricultural tech startup, has created the first fully autonomous beehive system called Bee Home. That's cute. <laughs> the Bee Home, yeah, that's good, isn't it? The Bee Home system comes complete with a beekeeping robot that acts as both medic and guardian to complement the natural intelligence of bees. The Bee Home system utilizes artificial intelligence, machine learning, and precision robotics to rescue and protect the hi a hive's bees. And the modular, commercially uh, AI-powered robotic apiary, an apiary means a collection of beehives, okay, also has 24-7 monitoring and smart technology that increases pollination capacity and honey production. The system is entirely solar-powered and manages 24 hives, that's an apiary, and automates their operations such as pollination, honey production, and 
reproduction, the bee home system also includes an automated robotic brood box management system, <laughs> a computer vision based monitoring system, AI based decision making and predictive anal uh, analytics, automated honey harvesting system, what? And an automated system for pest control, feeding, and thermo regulation. And again, this is non trivial because 35% global annual decline of bee colonies. Holy crud. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, and, and Ruff, we, we have about a minute left to talk about this, but I got to say yeah. that, you know, bees are, I, I got to say, people have really taken up the, the cause for bees. Like, you know, they, yes. they went through such a massive decline and, you know, a lot of yes. it was blamed on uh, large agriculture using those pesticides yes. that just, you know, really did not discriminate, um, yeah. you know, uh, across any insect uh, bee alike. And, you know, to kind of bring technology here, I like this one a lot more, you know, because we've talked about other tech that actually replaced bees with robots, you know, little flying drones that would actually deliver Oh, I get pollen. it, yeah, for pollination, um, yeah. <clears throat> which, you know, hey, it's still an avenue to to explore, but the idea of nurturing, taking care of, and allowing bees to repopulate all by themselves, that sounds like an equally, uh, you know, kind of a good use for technology. This is really Absolutely. cool. Absolutely. All right, so Ralph, uh, and and uh, yeah, there you go. So, and, and by the way, uh, for we hope that you're doing well in the chat room. It says hi to you, Ralph, as well. Uh, and hey, we say hi everyone and bye everyone at the same time because we're done. There's music playing in the background, Ralph, and that show went by super fast. Everyone, we yeah, missed. If I'm counting right, I think we missed about three or four stories. You can find them in the show notes. We'll have those up later this afternoon. Everyone, Ralph Bond as well, Ralph Bond Wicks. If you want to find his personal site with all of his past shows or our own YouTube channel and there's a category for Ralph Bond and you can see all of his segments right there on our YouTube channel as well. Ralph, I want to thank you so much for doing this once again. Hey, always a blast, buddy. All right, perfect. Everyone, have a great day. Have a great weekend. We hope that you stay safe, stay sane, stay cool. Everyone, we'll catch you next time. Bye, everyone. <laughs>